the Japanese came in silently, and the Allies had only five minutes' warning. The bombers sank one freighter, put another up on the beach as a wreck, and damaged an Australian minsweeper. They lost six planes in the fight on April 12th. The Japanese from Rabaul again hit New Guinea. Port Morby this time, a force of 175 planes, made the attack once again. The Zeros did their job admirably engaging the Allied fighters so their bombers could get through. But the pilots looked down on the shipping and found an unimpressive collection. Only a few small craft were in the harbour that day, so the big effort was largely wasted. The Japanese were back on April 14th this time to hit Mill Bay, where the observation planes had reported the presence of 14 TR transports. But by the time the Japanese attack arrived, all except four of the transports had cleared. This time nearly 190 planes came in from Rabul. The bombers again did their work. They sank one Dutch ship that was carrying ammunition and gasoline and damaged another. They damaged a British motor ship and shot up the airstrip near the town, setting off a fire in a fuel dump. Only seven planes were lost in the raid, and the Japanese came back as usual, full of stories Rabul headquarters sent the word to Admiral Yamamoto that his Operation Y had cost the enemy one cruiser three destroyers and more than two dozen transports plus 175 Allied planes, believing all that was true, which it was not the Japanese considered the operation a success. Admiral Yamamoto called a halt to the bombing, and the carrier planes were ordered back to their carriers. So Operation 1 came to an end, and was officially declared by the Japanese to, to have accomplished all it set out to do in the light of the events of the next few months. It seems to have been a waste of Japanese talent, although the losses were not particularly high on either side, if Yamamoto wanted to go to all the trouble of staging a special operation. Then why did he break it off so suddenly before it had accomplished what he wanted? One reason was not known to the Americans. At that moment, the naval aircraft shortage in the South Pacific would not permit much more. The 2004th Air Group, for example, suffered a steady attrition of planes, and its commander kept hounding 11th Air Fleet for more, but there were no more, and as it soon became painfully apparent to all, there were not enough planes on hand to accomplish the mission's plan. A commander would ask for 20 planes and get six. He would complain about the six and say that was not enough to fly a mission protecting bombers, and the answer was that it would have to be enough. That was the way the war was going in the South, and the airmen were the first to know that it was not good enough. But as they discovered, if they hounded higher authority long enough, there was absolutely nothing to be done about it. It was nine months since the Battle of Midway had been won by the Americans, because they were able to break the Japanese naval codes. The Japanese still did not know that the enemy could read their most secret communications, the Japanese returning from Midway had suggested that the enemy must have had some advanced knowledge and suspicion was directed at the code, but Imperial General Headquarters would not believe it. That code, like the German secret codes, depended on a complicated code machine. The developers swore that it was impossible to break the code, and Imperial Headquarters was satisfied, so the American radio intelligence teams continued to draw enormous advantage from the fact that they could tell what the Japanese were going to do, and when intelligence alone did not win battles, but it certain helped the radio intelligence section of naval intelligence at Pearl Harbor worked diligently, particularly with the submarine service to give out operational information, and yet try to preserve the closely guarded secret of the source of information so far, their efforts had been successful, but the maintenance of the secret was one of the big problems for the command since use could not be made of the material without sometimes threatening to compromise the source. The intelligence men were kept careful and lucky, and as of the spring of 1943, neither Admiral Yamamoto nor the High Command in Tokyo had the slightest inkling that the naval code was not secure thus on April 14th, when Yamamoto planned another frontline tour to bolster morale of the airmen in the South Pacific. Combined fleet headquarters had no hesitation in sending the information and Yamamoto's itinerary to all the bases and commands involved in messages using the secret naval code. The message was received at Shortlands Buin and Balal, giving the time of the Admiral's departure from the main naval airbase at Rabul, and the time and manner of his return. The message was also received by a United States Navy radio man at Dutch Harbour, Alaska,
whose monotonous job it was to monitor Japanese radio traffic. The radio man did not know what he was taking down, but he did know that all Japanese naval traffic was to be relayed to naval intelligence offices in Washington and in Pear Harbor. When the message about the Yamamoto trip was decoded, it created unusual activity in both commands at Pearl Harbor. Commander Edward T. Layton, the Pacific Fleet Intelligence Officer, discussed the possibility of assassinating the Japanese commander and concluded that the idea was sound. The radio intelligence team was worried because it seemed likely that if an attempt was made on Yamamoto at this time, the Japanese would draw the conclusion that their communications had been brief reached, but theirs was not the decision the yes or no rested in Washington. And here the information came first to Naval Intelligence Deputy Chief Captain Ellis Zacharias. Soon many top officials were in on the secret, and most of them seemed to agree that the assassination was very much in the United States' national interest, as the Japanese pointed out in their histories after the war, Yamamoto, although unknown to most Americans, was ranked by those in the know on the list of Axis ring leaders with the United States Navy. He was inscribed just after Emperor Hirohito and Prime Minister Tojo on the hate list. The reason for singling out Yamamoto for the honour was that he was regarded quite rightly as the architect of the sneak attack on Pearl Harbour, when the unusual message was received, several officials saw the opportunity for revenge. Indeed, the Japanese term for the whole affair was Fukushu Saku Revenge, military operation. That motivation certainly possessed America in general, and the politicians in particular. Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox pushed the matter, and President Franklin D. Roosevelt liked the idea at Pearl Harbor. Admiral Nimitz, with his cool engineer's mind, considered the matter in a different manner. Yamamoto was a professional naval officer just as Nimitz was, and under other circumstances the shoe might be on the other foot. What could such a move accomplish? Was it worth the obvious danger of compromising the ultra-secret? The knowledge of the Japanese code. In the end, he decided it was Nimitz, sent a message to Admiral Holly at Newer, saying that if Holly thought he could manage the assassination, he was authorised to begin preliminary planning. That last phrase indicated that the final decision would be made at a higher level, and Holly had to be prepared to abandon the plan if the decision was negative. The war was an extremely personal matter to Admiral Holly since the Pearl Harbor attack. He had hated all Japanese with a hearty passion, and Admiral Yamamoto was third on his personal bad list when the message arrived at. Numa Holly was in Australia on a flying trip conferring with General MacArthur about future operations in the South and Southwest Pacific. The Admiral's staff, however, knew the Admiral's mind, and in short order the message was sent on to Rear Admiral Mark Mitcher, the new commander of land-based aircraft in the Solomons. Admiral Mitcher, like Admiral Holly, was an aggressive fighter. He did not hesitate to accept the challenge, nor did he concern himself with the possible repercussions on the ultra-secret of such an assassination. These matters were for higher authority. Within a matter of hours he had conferred with his staff, plotted the possibilities, and returned a message saying that it could be done when Admiral High returned to Numa. He was delighted to learn of the plans he referred to Yamamoto as the Peacock, because of the Japanese Admiral's enormous dignity and his habit of appearing in public only in full-dress uniform, complete with gloves and a ceremonial sword. Holly's feelings about Yamamoto were perhaps more personal than those against the others. He knew the Japanese admiral from the old days, when he had visited Japan as a junior officer with the Great White Fleet that President Theodore Roosevelt had sent around the world. Holly took the, the unannounced Pearl Harbor attack as a personal affront, and not long after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Yamamoto had been quoted in neutral countries as saying he was looking forward to dictating peace in the White House. Rather, Yamamoto was misquoted. What he had said was that the sort of peace he was being asked about by the reporter could only be dictated at the White House, and what he had meant was that only the President of the United States could stop the war. In fact, Yamamoto alone among the Japanese leaders had opposed war with the United States until Japanese and American policies had made it inevitable. Still, although the wheels were in motion, the matter was not decided, and in Washington Captain Zacharias vigorously advocated the assassination. The Japanese Navy, he said, could claim no other figure so beloved by the men of the fleet and the general public 
and speaking technically there was no other in the Japanese Navy with the flair and dash of Yamamoto on a military level, said, Zacharias, the assassination attempt was as much worthwhile as it was on a political level, but the decision was still not yet made, and there was only one man who could make it, President Roosevelt. It was one thing to advocate the assassination in principle, and quite another to learn that it was feasible, and then put the official stamp on it. Viewed from hindsight, the decision was anything but chivalrous, but chivalry had no place in World War II with the outbreak of war the United States had for the first time joined. The advocates of unrestricted submarine warfare atrocities had been committed from the beginning by the Japanese in the death marches in the newly captured countries, the beheading of airmen shot down over Japan in the Doit raid, and most recently the torture and murder of European civilians in the Solomons, the Americans had responded in like manner, and the no-quarter character of the war was well established. President Roosevelt approved the assassination, and when the message went from Washington to Pearl Harbor to New Mayer, it bore the signature of Secretary Frank K. N. X. So in a matter of hours the assassination was on, Admiral Holly was informed that the matter was cleared. He sent a message to Admiral Mitcher Nimitz, had asked Holly if he could make such an interception so far away, because even three months earlier, Holly would not have had the resources to do the job. But those resources had recently become available in the increased number of P-38 long-range fighter interceptor planes in the South Pacific. A number of them had come up to. Efficient his party was precisely following the itinerary established for him, six o'clock takeoff had been made. As announced, the first stop would be Balal, where they were to arrive at 8 a.m. Tokyo time, and spend just enough time for the Admiral to address his fighting men. The pilots tightened up the formation as they moved out to sea and up to 5,000 feet altitude. A little scattered cloud appeared, but visibility was excellent, and as Admiral Yugaki noted in his diary, flying conditions could not have been better. The pilots were a little nervous with so much responsibility, and they tightened the formation until the planes were flying wing-towing with the tips nearly touching. They passed over the northern tip of Banville, and then below they could see the base at Bua. They went on without incident when they neared Balal. They were particularly careful because that airfield was perched on the edge of the jungle, and one false move would send a plane spiralling into the thick mass of trees and creepers. But all of these pilots were experienced flyers, and they had made the trip so many times it almost seemed like a milk run since the Admiral was expected by 9.30, a.m. United States time, which was 8 a.m. Japanese time. All the base personnel were lined up along the runway from the commander on down. They waited, watching for the planes aboard the lead bomber. The pilot sent back a message for the Admiral. They were ahead of schedule, and they would arrive at Balal at 7.45 a.m. immediately after the Admiral had said a few words to the assembled troops they would head for the harbour, and the sub-chaser that had been laid on for the Admiral's trip to the shortlands. There was no question about going down there by plane. Shortlands was the site of a destroyer and seaplane base. It was virtually on the edge of the combat zone, and any movement by air might be expected to bring about an American air attack, and it wasn't certain, but it was too great a possibility to ignore by 9.45 a.m. The Admiral would have spoken to the men of the Shortlands bases, and he would be ready to board his ship again and speed for Balal at 11 a.m., he would board his bomber again, and escorted by the six zeros, would make the ten-minute flight to Bua, where he would lunch with the assembled officers of the Naval Command and Naval Air Command at one. P.M. he would be in the air again on his way back to Rabal, and would arrive at 3.40 p.m. United States time. The result of this busy day, Admiral Yamamoto knew from experience, would be to put new life into his frontline defenders. Despite the doleful warnings of his colleagues, Yamamoto knew that at this time morale was the most important asset his command could have, and so he had never wavered in his insistence on making the dangerous trip the air flight down had been so uneventful that even the worried Admiral Ugaki had relaxed, he had written in his diary, and napped until warned by the crew of his bomber that they were approaching landing at Henderson Field on Guad Canal at 7am or 5am Japanese time. Admiral Mitcher was sitting in his jeep on the apron of the runway as 18 P-38 pilots came trooping down to the flight line and climbed aboard their planes, the American takeoff to intercept Admiral Waimoto's flight just before it landed at Balal, 
had to be earlier than the Japanese takeoff from Rabul, because the distance was greater for the American effort, Mitchell had chosen the 339th Army Air Force Fighter Squadron, because he had come to respect that unit's abilities in the two weeks since he had come to take over command of the land-based air forces in the Solomons. These fighter pilots knew their business, and their record against the recent Japanese air raids showed it also. The P-38 almost seemed to have been built for just such a job as the interception of Admiral. Yamamoto's Flight the problem from the moment that Mitya had Holly's message about the Yamamoto trip was to figure out how many planes to send, what opposition they might expect, and how they were going to get to Banville and back, a straight-line round trip of about 650 miles. It meant that someone was going to have to do extremely accurate dead-reckoning navigation, and that auxiliary gasoline tanks would have to be brought in for the P-38S. They were not normally used by fighter planes at Guadcanal at this time, because of the short range of most missions and the added danger of fire. It also meant flying down on the deck most of the way to avoid detection by Japanese radar. That requirement made the mission even more difficult. The P-38 was designed for high altitude, and down on the deck the engines consumed three times as much fuel some of the pilots might have to ditch on the way home when the preliminary plans had been made. Major John W. Mitchell, the commanding officer of the 339th, had been called in and given the assignment Admiral Mitchell had particularly asked that four specified pilots be sent on the mission. They were Captains Thomas Larnia and Rex Barber, and Lieutenants Joseph Moore and James McClanahan. They had performed very well in the big Japanese raid of Operation One on April 7th, claiming a total of seven Japanese planes shot down on on that same day, the Marines flying Wildcat and Corsair fighters had lost seven planes to the Zeros. The outcome of that air battle then had showed the superiority of the P-38 and the excellence of this particular group of pilots, the planners at Henderson Field, had worked meticulously even to the point of anticipating that Yamamoto's plane would arrive at Balal 15 minutes early, because on the morning of April 18th the usual southeast wind would not be blowing, so they would have no headwinds to buck. The Americans decided to use 18 planes, even though they had no knowledge of the size of the Japanese force of Zeros that would be covering Yamamoto, and had to assume that they would run the danger of being jumped by all of the 100 Army Zeros based on Banville, but only 18 P-38S were available. Other fighters could come along and cover the rear, but their value would be to stop a chase by Zeros after the fact they couldn't keep up with the P-38S, nor could the P-38S slow down for their companions Major Mitchell figuring his logistics estimated that if they flew at optimum speed, they would have about five minutes in the target zone before fuel became critical. The route he planned made the trip a third longer, and to avoid detection he would bypass the new Georgia group and fly out of sight of land. The distance then would be 400 more miles to the target, but the extra tanks should take care of that. The success of this mission depended on getting in and getting out in a hurry. Just a few hours before the mission was to begin, Major Mitchell learned from a new intercepted message that the Japanese escort would be only six zeros, but that did not mean the 100 Banville zeros would not be primed to look for enemy incursion at 7.10pm. United States time, Mitchell's P-38 took off, followed by the three others of his flight. Admiral Mitcher waved from his jeep as the planes passed the apron on their way to the runway. The next four planes were the shooters led by Captain Lanier, and on takeoff, McClanahan's plane blew a tyre and his flight was scrubbed. There was not a minute to wait for him. Now there were 17 P-38S in the air. The planes circled until all had taken off and the squadron joined up at 7.25pm and headed west. Half an hour out, Moore's plane refused to respond to a switch to the drop tanks, and he had to turn back. Mitchell motioned two other pilots, Beesby Holmes and Ray Hine, to move up to join Lanier's flight. They would be the new shooters, and now the strike. Force was down to 16, the planes droned on, and Mitchell took them down on the deck. This was dangerous flying, and they learned how dangerous when one P-38 very nearly crashed into the sea, there was no way of controlling absolute height at high speed, and in the winds some planes flew at ten feet above the surface, 
and some at fifty-one fell so low that prop wash from the plane ahead drenched the windshield and blinded the pilot. He was lucky to be able to climb above the danger zone. They were so low, all sixteen planes, that their propellers left wakes like those of powerboats so low that the pilots could see big fish, including many sharks, swimming in the clear Pacific water. The whole flight was over waterer far to the west of Columbangara and New Georgia. Mitchell had chosen this course to avoid detection by Japanese coast watchers, who were just as effective as the Australians at 8.20pm. Major Mitchell changed course, and half an hour later he changed course again. The planes passed around Vel Lelale Island and turned to the northeast, still right down on top of the water. By this time, with half an hour still to go, the pilots were growing restless. They had flown a long way without seeing anything but their own planes. The strain of keeping the planes so close to the water made them nervous. None of them had ever spent so much time out of sight of land before. Suddenly the mist that had Lynn over the water cleared, and ahead of them they saw Banville Mitchell made out the landmark they had come in just southeast of Empress Oster Bay, which had been his point of aim. They were one minute ahead of schedule. But where was Yamamoto Lieutenant? Douglas Canning was the first to see other aircraft just off to the left and higher than... than they were the Americans counted. There were the six fighters, as unwittingly advertised by the Japanese, but there also were two, not one, but two Betty bombers. Mitchell had not been prepared for this development. It seemed questionable that the four P-38 AS assigned the shooter's role could take on both bombers, but there was nothing else to be done. Mitchell turned to parallel the course of the Japanese and began to climb. It was time to drop the auxiliary tanks, which could now only impede manoeuvre variability and increase the danger of fire and explosion. Mitchell dropped his several pilots had trouble with theirs, including Holmes, who moved out of formation and manoeuvred his plane to try to shake the tanks loose. Hine joined him in the approved fashion to protect the other P-38, and so two of the shooters were out of position. Lanier and Barber went on heading out to intercept the Japanese formation the Japanese flew on, not seeing anything out of the ordinary, until one pilot finally caught the silvery flash of jettison auxiliary tanks in the sky and shouted out the warning the Zeros turned toward the enemy planes. Lanier engaged one of them and shot it down. Meanwhile, Admiral Yamamoto's plane had turned sharply toward Buin and went down on the deck, just above the jungle tops. Admiral Yugaki pilot turned the other way out to sea. Barber was the first to attack. He saw one of the bombers ahead of him and opened fire pieces began flying off the unarmoured plane and the Betty made a sharp turn to the left and then plunged toward the beach. Barra never saw it fall. He was too busy with three zeros on his tail until planes from the cover above got after them and scattered them, Lanfia having tangled with one zero, then went after the other bomber and nearly collided with a pair of zeros that were trying to intercept him. He got behind the bomber and began to fire his guns. The right engine shot out a jet of flame and the wing tank caught fire. The bomber began to burn. The right wing came off and the plane plunged into the jungle and exploded the two zero pilots then began to chase Lania Butt. He managed to get into a climb and to outdistance them with the twin engines. When he reached 20,000 feet and looked around, they were gone. Holmes finally cleared his auxiliary tanks, and he and Hine came in looking for the bombers. They saw one fall into the jungle and another chased by a lone P-38, which had three zeros on its tail. They sped to the rescue and began firing at the zeros Holmes claimed to have shot down two of them, and then he too went after the second bomber using his 20mm cannon and the 50 caliber machine guns Admiral Yugaki bomber jined and weaved and tried to get away and down below at Cahill Airfield. Every operational zero was trying to get into the air to join the battle. From his vantage point inside Admiral Yugaki watched the battle battle and saw the men in the plane dying as one of the P-38S laced the bomber with heavy fire. He did not realise that the P-38S were shooting cannon, but he did see that the 7.7mm guns of the Betty could not reach the P-38 while the fighter was working over the bomber the men inside began to fall. The tail gunner, the crew chief, the waste gunners and some of Yamamoto's staff from above the Americans saw the bomber disintegrate as it struck the water 
But this was not quite the case. The pilot, seeing that he could not escape the P-38 that was after him, pushed the wheel down and opted to make a crash landing in the sea. The bomber began to fall, and as he neared the water, the pilot tried to pull out of the dive to pancake in. But the plane did not respond to the controls, and she struck at full speed, the left wing broke away, which lessened the impact in the fuselage and probably saved Uji's life. The plane rolled over to the left and began to sink. Admiral Ugaki was thrown out of his seat and scrambled up the aisle and out of the broken fuselage around him. The sea blazed with burning gasoline, but he managed to avoid it. He looked around him. A boat was coming at high speed from the shore. The pilot and one other Yamamoto staff officer, Rear Admiral Kitamura, had also survived, and they were all rescued within a few minutes above the zeros from Cahill Airfield had begun taking off and gaining altitude to attack the American planes. Zeros got above Barber Holmes and Hine and started an attack. Barber and Holmes managed to get away, but Hine was shot down up above Major Mitchell called his pilots to start home, and the whole action had taken less than five minutes, but time was short as he knew it would be. He headed toward Guadcanal, and the other P-38S turned several of them lost touch with the formation and straggled home by the elves. Major, Mitchell brought his pilots home. Lania came in alone after several other planes had landed. He was scarcely out of his P-38 than he was shouting, I got Yamamoto, I got Yamamoto soon. Barber was on the ground making the same claim, and then along came Holmes, who landed first at the emergency field in the Russell. He told the whole story on the airstrip to a gang of marines, and his version was that perhaps he had shot down the bomber carrying the Japanese admiral. The whole affair became enormously confused, and the number of zeros claimed by the pilots was far in excess of the three that had gone down. The combat intelligence officers finally straightened out the figures a little. The number of zeros was reduced to three, but they gave credit to Lania Holmes and Barber for one bomber each. Since there were only two bombers involved, it was indeed confused with the exception of the flyers involved, no one cared, and the fact was that there was a good chance that Yamamoto was dead Mitcher, so informed Holly in a guarded message that referred obliquely to the Yamamoto plane two bombers escorted by Zeros flying close formation, one shot down, believed to be test flight when that message was received at Hall's headquarters. The joy was almost as unrestrained as it had been on Guadcanal when Admiral Mitcher had presented the army pilots with a case of bourbon whiskey. Admiral Kelly Turner let out a war whoop. Holly pretended it was nothing. Hold on, Kelly. What's so good about it? I'd hoped to lead that bad guy up Pennsylvania Avenue in chains with the rest of you kicking him where it would do the most good. Then Holly sent a message to Mitre congratulations to you, and Major Mitchell and his hunters sounds as though one of the ducks in their bag was a peacock. There was nothing Holly would have liked better than to announce the victory to the world. But what would happen if he did? During the day, a number of ranking officers in Washington, Pearl Harbor and Newer began to have second thoughts. Simultaneously, several officers realized that there was no way the Americans could have known that Admiral Yamamoto was aboard one of those planes, except by intercepting a secret coded message Holly sent a rocket to Admiral Mitcher, warning him that the mission must be kept absolutely secret for fear of compromising the codebreakers. It was a little late news. Real cameramen on Guadan Al had already taken hundreds of feet of film, and reporters had the story in their notebooks. All the film was confiscated, and the reporters were put on notice that their story was censored. Mitcher ordered the P-38S out again the next day to fly a routine mission over Buan just to show themselves, so the impression on the Japanese would be that the Americans had begun regular fighter sweeps in the area. It was the next day before the Japanese could launch a proper search in into the jungle near Boon, and several hours later before the searchers came upon the wreckage of the bomber that had crashed there, the search was interrupted by those P-38ES which swept overhead, coming into strafe Cahill airfield. But in ten minutes the planes were gone and the search proceeded. The searchers found the plane and the bodies, and all aboard had been killed in the crash. Admiral Yamamoto had obviously been at the controls, and he had been thrown clear along with Admiral Takata. His staff, the bodies of the others in the plane, had been badly burned by the fire. But Yamamoto's body was intact and 
and the white gloves and ceremonial sword he had brought with him on his last flight were there. The bodies were taken back by litter to the shore and then by submarine chaser to Buin there on April 20th. The body of Admiral Yamamoto was cremated with the others. The ashes were placed in little boxes and then taken to Rabao. The flagship Maoshi came down from TRU with the whole fleet behind it. The N containing the Admiral's ashes was placed aboard in his Commander-in-Chief's quarters, along with those of the six staff officers killed with him the fleet left for true, and after a short stop there they went on to Tokyo, and the shock reverberated through the South Pacific. Something had to be done about command, so Admiral Minichi Koga was appointed to be commander of the combined fleet, but it would not be the same. Japan had lost the great hero of the war. The military and the public were not told about the death of Yamamoto until the funeral fleet arrived in Tokyo Bay in May. Then Japan gave itself over to a period of mourning only a day or two after the event, Army and Navy headquarters at Rabaul sent messages to the Imperial General Staff in Tokyo suggesting that the ambush could not have been accidental. The Americans must have broken the secret naval code, they said, but in Tokyo it was easy for the code experts to assert once again that it was totally impossible for the Americans to break the machine code. They would have to have a code machine of the same sort on the same settings. There was no way this could have happened, said the Japanese experts. Everyone knew that there had never been a breach of security in this regard, so although faced with the evidence and warned by the strongly expressed suspicions of the men in the field, Imperial General Headquarters refused to believe, and the Japanese codes remained as they were the major weakness of the Imperial Navy throughout the Pacific War. When the deed was in the making, the Americans involved in the Yamamoto affair were warned to say nothing. The 17 living pilots who had been assigned to the mission were immediately grounded, sent back to Numa, lectured by General Millard Harmon, commander of the 5th Air Force, and then sent back to the United States at every step. They were warned that if they said a word about the mission, they would be court-martialed. They be medals and promotions, and were assigned to duty in the United States for the rest of the war. Everyone on Guadcanal and in the Russell who knew anything about the mission was also threatened with the direst of fates if he breathed a word. Yet the story got out. An Australian newspaper got hold of it and printed it, and it was also printed and broadcast widely in South America. So the Japanese knew that there had been a breach of security. But that arrogance in Tokyo continued. The Imperial General Staff heard the story and dismissed it, as they had the complaints of the admirals and generals at Rabul. The American secret was saved, had the assassination been worth the risk to be sure Yamamoto was an important figure, and even the President of the United States had concurred in the affair, one might say that he had passed the death sentence. The irony is that of all the Japanese leaders, Yamamoto at that period in the war had the most realistic view of the future, and had the war war continued to go as badly as it did go, it is conceivable that he could have had a hand in bringing it to an end earlier than August 1945, but also as the death of Field. Marshal Erwin Rommel also proved the fact was that no individual in the war was indispensable or worth the price of that broken code, and had the Japanese leaders in Tokyo recognised what had happened, the course of the war might have been changed. Certainly many ship movements would never have been reported to the submarines, and it is possible that some battles might have had a different result. In the end, the outcome would have been the same. There was no denying the effect of American production over the long haul, but had the fact of the broken code been accepted in Tokyo, many more Japanese lives might have been saved, and many more American lives lost in authorising the Yamamoto mission. The Americans had taken a chance that seems much more risky now than it seemed then, in the euphoria of the moment. As it happened, it turned out all right for them. They were very, very lucky since the previous January. Admiral Holly and General MacArthur had been building up their forces in preparation for the 1943 Allied offensives in the South and Southwest Pacific theatres. The military situation was almost the reverse of what it had been six months earlier when the Japanese and the Solomons had controlled the air and the sea. Holly's preparations included frequent strikes against the Japanese air bases on New Georgia and Columbangara Islands from the air and by sea using cruisers and destroyers. 
but the Japanese doggedly continued to supply their forward garrisons, in spite of frequent American air attacks, except for the loss of the Mumo and Murasame the spring supply runs had been routine until March 29th that afternoon. Allied planes caught a six-ship convoy at Rata Bay and sank subchaser number 28. The captain and 29 men were killed in the attack, and two days later three Japanese destroyers visited the same spot without incident. They brought supplies and evacuated 25 men suffering from fever. That evening the destroyers Samidare, Akumo Kagumo Yugumo and Asumo cleared Rabul Harbour and headed for the forward bases at about 6.50pm. They were attacked by a large formation of enemy planes, and as darkness lowered the planes dropped flares and began to attack all five ships, the destroyers scattered and took evasive action. The only ship hurt in all this action was the Sidara. A near miss damaged the riveting in the crew's compartment after, and the area began to flood under the circumstances. The captain of the Sidar decided it was too risky to try to unload and perhaps have his ship sink under him, so he turned back toward the shortlands but returned to Columbangara and unloaded his supplies and troops with without further incident. Since in March, General Imamura, the commander of the Eth Area Army, had ordered the reinforcement of the Central Solomon's bases, several battalions of infantry field artillery and specialist troops were sent down along with. That the way to fight zeros was to keep formation, the time was five minutes after eleven. Tokyo time, and the fight could not last more than an hour. The Japanese didn't have enough fuel to prolong the combat. Actually, it lasted considerably less. Lieutenant Manano and a force of thirty sat above the conflict, directing, and when necessary swooping down to help some zero in trouble. Manano kept an eye on his fuel indicator, and when the critical moment came he broke off. The engagement formed up his aircraft and headed back to Rabul when the pilots arrived at the debriefing the attack force claimed to have won. They had said Lieutenant Miano accomplished precisely what they set out to do, and what was that mission seemingly so aimless, it was the mission that had been entrusted to the Rabal Air Force by Admiral Yamamoto to destro, destroy Allied air righty in the Southern Solomons, so that the Japanese effort in New Guinea could proceed without hindrance from that quarter. Lieutenant Miano's report said that both sides combined put about 130 planes into the air that day over Guadcanal, and the Japanese returned home in complete victory, having shot down 41 American aircraft that was not the American recollection. American and New Zealand pilots that day claimed 16 Japanese S with a loss of half a dozen of their own. What the battle showed was the continued reliance of the Japanese air forces on outmoded tactics. The arrival of the P-38 in the Solomons changed the whole air war. Yamamoto had been aware of the improving quality of the American fighting equipment, and he had commented that he was very much more concerned about that than about the quality of the American fighting men. But the fact was that both the equipment and the men were becoming more effective at the, the arts of war. There was very little the Japanese could do about it, given their limited production capacity. They could and did produce growing numbers of aircraft at home. But that production was based on the use of existing dyes. The aircraft manufacturers were continually improving the existing aircraft, for example, Admiral Yamamoto's last bomber had been given a much longer range. It could travel 2,300 mile. But introduction of entirely new types was another matter, and for all practical purposes, the Japanese would fight the entire war with the same weapons with which they had started. The Americans, on the other hand, were constantly improving their aircraft. When the war began, the P-38 did not exist, nor did the P-51, which also would make its appearance in Pacific waters, nor the F-6F, which went into five versions, each improved over the last, nor the torpedo bomber, nor the Black Cat radar-controlled fighter. These new aircraft were beginning to come into the American Air Forces, along with the B-25 medium bomber and the A-20 attack bomber in 1943. The changes came very fast, the Japanese pilots, became indisputably aware of that fact early in June, when observers over the Russell Islands noted that the Americans had completed two airfields there and that both housed marine fighters. The shocking part was that the Japanese bombers had been claiming they were interdicting the American supply lines – 
and obviously this was untrue. Lieutenant Miano came back to his unit's base at Rab's eastern airfield with a suggestion for new tactics. Since the bombers had failed to stop the building of the airfields, the fighters undertake the destruction of the fields and the aircraft on the ground. He wanted the Zeros equipped with wing racks to carry 130B bombs. The suggestion met with the usual opposition from ordnance officers and purists, but the fact was that some new tactic had to be tried, so the group commander agreed to let Lieutenant Miano have his way and on June 7th, when the next big mission took place, two Zeros were so equipped they would fly in with the other fighters, and then, while the others lured the Americans aloft, the bombing Zeros would try their luck on this day. 81 Zeros from the 582 and 251st Air Groups were employed. They flew down across the Russell, and was their usual tactic this time heading from north to south across the islands. There were the airfields below, and indeed they were operational. It seemed unbelievable to the Japanese that the change could have occurred so quickly, and the implications were not lost from this time on the relatively short-range Scout Bomber 2C dive bombers and F-4F and F-4U fighters could reach Bun when equipped with auxiliary gas tanks. For the first time, the Americans had the ability to strike hard at the interior Japanese bases. Perhaps the optimistic fighter pilots thought they could succeed where the bombers had failed. The experimental fighter bombers had excellent protection as they came in over the southern Russell Island airfield. Three other Zeros were on their left and four on their right. The other fighters moved on high and continued to look for the enemy, and the bombing planes moved slowly down to carry out their mission. Suddenly a pair of P-38S flashed in between between them and their escorts. The escorting fighters had let just a little too much distance develop between them and their charges, and the bombing planes were shot down. The new tactic turned out to be a complete failure that day. The melee became general, and once again a swarm of Allied aircraft of half a dozen varieties rose up to meet the enemy. Generally speaking, the P-40 was not much of a match for the Zero. It did not have the climbing speed, the range or the altitude capability of the Japanese plane. But in a scrap at low altitude, the P-40 was a plane to reckon with, and that day a dozen of them from the 44th Fighter Squadron were involved. The Allied planes did well. They shot down 23 zeros, or about 30% of the force that had come down the slot. The Allies lost nine planes, and all the pilots were recovered. That was one advantage of fighting above your own territory in this springtime of 1943. The attrition among Japanese Japanese naval pilots was becoming one of the most difficult problems the Rabao Air Fleet Command had to face. A few, such as Lieutenant Miano and Warrant Officer Ari Awara, seemed to have charmed lives. Miano had participated in the original airstrikes against Clarkfield in the Philippines. He had served aboard the carrier Junor with skill enough to merit one of the Japanese fleet air arms rare promotions O'Hara had flown from Buin. He had fought in many of the Guad Canal and New Guinea battles on May 13th. He had been involved with a pair of F-4U fighters and had shot them down, then made a forced landing at Columbangara. He had been in the middle of the fracas with the P-38S that day and escaped unscathed. Another very skilful pilot was Enin Yoshio Oki, of the 251st Fighter Group. He had already shot down a dozen enemy planes and had served a tour of duty in New Guinea, had then been returned to Japan for treatment of wounds, and was now on his second South Pacific tour, the dreadful disaster of the convoy to L the death of Yamamoto, and the sure knowledge that more and better Allied aircraft were arriving constantly in the South Pacific brought a subtle change to the morale of the Japanese flyers. They now spoke of the air lane between Rabul and Guadalcanal as Semeter Alley and sometimes of their aircraft as flying coffins. There was no more talk about ever-victorious forces around the airfield. There was no shirking. The flyers went out day after day as bravely as ever and fought as hard as ever, but many of them now considered themselves to be doomed. They had no hope of seeing their homeland again. Morale was lifted with the arrival of an improved version of the second dive bomber. The Americans called the new arrivals VALS. The pilots felt they had a little better chance of survival in the new planes, and some new Zeros were also coming down the pipeline from Japan. They were faster and had a longer range than the Model 11 that many of the pilots had been flying.
Still, the designers and factories were producing basically the same sort of aircraft as before, fast and manoeuvrable but extremely vulnerable. Probably there was no way to make a basic change to protect the pilots without sacrificing the Zero best qualities. The new Zeros, like the old, burned with the ferocity of welding torches once they were hit in the vitals. Early in June, the 2004th Air Group got a dozen of the new Zeros. The shipment was part of the build-up for the new air war Admiral Koga had decreed to advance the Japanese cause in the Solomons and New Guinea. The 204th also got a new commanding officer, Lieutenant Commander Tomo Oyama. This officer's arrival was indicative. Of the Japanese Naval Air Force's biggest problem, adequately trained personnel Lieutenant Commander Oyama had been fighting for a long time. His experience went back to the early days of the war in China. He had flown a fighter in the initial attack on Clarkfield in the Philippines and had served in that entire campaign, and he had also fought in the Selles Borneo, Java and Timor. He had then been sent back to Japan to become a test pilot. Now he was coming back to the front to fight again. Because the Navy needed experienced men, the new Zeros had an immediate impact on morale, and on June 3, Several of the most experienced pilots escorted a flight of bombers out of Bun in an attack on Guadcanal. There were 24 Zeros in the force that day. They ran into several packs of F-4Us and F-4Fs and came home to claim six American planes shot down with no losses to themselves. The American record does not bear out any such one-sided victory, but as usual pilots in combat are not very good judges of such matters. Elated by the victory of June 3rd, the pilots of the 204 fighter group returned to Guadcanal the next day. In fact, they would be fighting almost steadily for the next 12 days, along with the 251st fighter group and the 582 fighter group either around Guadcanal or over New Guinea. Then came June 16th, which was to go down in the Rabul records as one of the bloodiest and most disastrous days of the whole war. For the Zero squadrons, the Japanese were waiting to deal a decisive blow to the American build-up they had been watching in the Russell and at Guadcanal, where Admiral Kelly Turner's amphibious landing organisation was operating out of a camp near Lunga Point, as the Japanese observation planes reported something was about to break. There were too many American cargo ships in the harbour, and just too much activity for the lull in the land war to continue. Admiral Kogre hoped to head off an American invasion of the Central Solomons by prompt and decisive action after wearing out the Americans by attrition. He would then launch an attack of his own, combined with an army move, win a fleet engagement retake Guadcanal, and force the Americans to the peace table, if that plan sounds peculiarly like one of Admiral Yamamoto's. Why it was, Admiral Koga was a disciple of Yamamoto. The next Japanese effort, he said, was to be a major attack on the four major airfields on Guadcanal, and in the rustles and destruction of the vessels lined up in Lunga Roads on June 10th, a troop convoy was spotted by Japanese search planes. This convoy aroused the pilot's interest because the scouts also saw a carrier, she was the escort carrier Swanee, and like all carriers a prize coveted by the Japanese Navy pilots, a strike from Rabul sent half a dozen twin-engine bombers to attack the carrier, but all of them were shot down that day by American fighters from Guadcanal.